All right. Um, hello, everyone, uh, and welcome um, to our event with Vijay Prashad. We are going to be discussing his book. Um, I'll just introduce myself and my co MC real quickly. My name is Misty, and I'm with the Anti War Committee, um, and I'm here joined with uh, my co facilitator, Anthony, and our guest. Um, real quickly, I'll just tell you about us. Um, the Anti War Committee is an all volunteer grassroots organization based out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Since 1999, we have been opposed to all US wars and occupations, and we continue to struggle against injustices from the occupation of Palestine to police violence in the streets here at home. Uh, shout out to the teachers strike here in Minneapolis. We believe in peace through justice, and we stand in solidarity with oppressed peoples at home and abroad. And um, I'm going to turn it over to my co-facilitator to introduce our guest. All right, thank you, Misty. Uh, so tonight, uh, our very special guest is Vijay Prashad. Uh, he is the director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. The Tricontinental is an international movement-driven institution focused on stimulating intellectual debate that serves people's aspirations. Uh, Vijay is also an Indian historian, journalist, and the chief editor of Leftward Books. Uh, he is the author of over two dozen books, including Red Star Over the Third World, Arab Spring, Libyan Winter, and his most recent book, which we'll be discussing here tonight, uh, Washington Bullets, A History of the CIA, Coups, and Assassinations. Uh, BJ, it's an honor to be able to spend some time here with you tonight. Uh, thank you for, for uh, taking some time out of your really busy schedule uh, to join us. Hey, it's nice to be here. I, I was actually attracted to the name of your uh, group, the Anti-War Committee. And I thought, well, there's a kind of retro feel to it, something, something committee. Um, and then that it was anti-war uh, struck me as, as well, worth um, us having a conversation. So, Anthony, you said, talk a little about the book. So I'm going to talk a little about the book, if that's okay. And then, you know, we can, but I, I won't take too much time. I... Um, I want to actually talk about why I wrote this book and why the book looks like it does. Okay. So, because it's a book club kind of conversation, let's stay there. Um, there's the book. Wow. Okay. The English edition, at least. Um, yeah. Uh, a cover designed by Tings, who is one of the best designers, a designer at Tricontinental, actually, as well. Uh, it's a good idea to have the bullets running through. The title is, of course, from the clash. If People don't know um, the music of the Clash. It's from um, the the song "Washington Bullets" on Sandinista, and it's a terrific song because it's about U.S. imperialism, but also other things. And anyway, in October 2019, I got a phone message from uh, Bolivia saying that there's going to be a coup against Evo Morales. Now, if you don't know anything about Bolivia, uh, Evo Morales became the president after a rolling series of popular movements, movements against privatization of water in Cochabamba, movements against the privatization of gas, movements led by coca farmers, of whom Evo Morales was a leader. And he came to power and he ruled, winning three elections for 14 years, during which time improved the conditions of people's lives immeasurably century plus of deprivation was really overcome. Quite extraordinary when you see the dignity uh, that was infused through the policies put in place by Morales. He won a fourth election. It was contested uh, severely by the right wing and the US government. Um, but then this message came and I called Noam Chomsky and we released a statement which was published in Bolivian media and other places saying, you know, don't make a coup. It's a bad idea for a country, you know, fight in the polls. Don't make a coup, that kind of thing. Well, General Williams Kaliman went into Morales' office and said to him, you got to go. And now Morales, this was in November, November 2019. Morales' third term actually wouldn't have ended before January 2020. So even if you believe the election, the fourth election was contested, Liberals should have protested that he wasn't allowed to finish his constitutionally mandated third term. You know, he still had a month and a half to go. But no, no, no liberal complained about that. Um, you know, uh, no, no right-wingers, of course, complained. 
Evo was hounded out of the country and enormous violence was brought to bear against indigenous people. The Vifala, the flag of the indigenous was burnt in public. Um, the woman who came in, Jeanette Anias, you know, arrived with a giant Bible and said Christianity is back in Bolivia, meaning that, you know, the indigenous people are, are animists and, and so on, barbarians. I mean, they used vicious Nazi-like language. If you don't know about Bolivia, Klaus Barbie, the great butcher of of Marseille or Lyon, I think, the Nazi uh, left Europe after World War II and, and went to Bolivia, where he became the head of, of the Secret Service and created a Nazi kind of culture in Bolivian, inside the Bolivian state. Um, and that culture exists still today in places like Santa Clara. There are, you know, I've seen these fellas. They walk around with um, the insignia, which is familiar if you understand the history of Nazism fascism. Um, they came to power after that coup. Now, what interested me was, friends, that entire media outlets all around the United States, Britain, you know, very many parts of Latin America and so on, started to say it wasn't a coup. Morales had overstayed his welcome. You know, the first indigenous head of government in Bolivia, a country with a large indigenous population. Oh, this Indian has been there for too long, was the attitude. Meanwhile, nobody complained about Angela Merkel in Germany, who had been chancellor longer than Evo Morales, you know. But this guy could go. Incredible racist attitude. And they said, there's no coup, you know. Liberal left people were saying there's no coup. This frustrated me greatly, you know, and the way the propaganda worked around this. Uh, Morales was then in Mexico. I was really frustrated. Um, I, I've been writing about this kind of stuff for years, you know, overthrow of governments. I've interviewed so many CIA people, you know, they tell you directly when they've retired. I'd been trying to write a book about the assassination of a U.S. ambassador in Afghanistan. So in the context of that, the killing of dubs, I interviewed a bunch of people in the agency. And they told me interesting stories. I had notes all over the place. I spent a month, you know, I wrote this book in a month. I wrote it as if I was on Benzedrine, you know. Uh, but I wasn't on Benzedrine. I was on a combination of anger and frustration and, and hope, really, because the book is filled with poetry. And I wrote it really fast. Um, Morales read uh, the pressy of it in Spanish. And he agreed to write the opening section, which was amazing for me, you know, because the book is, in a sense, dedicated to the coup in Bolivia. Um, in, the, in the forward, Evo writes that, you know, this is not over yet. And the people will have the last word. Well, just a few months after the book was published, the Bolivian people fought in an election hard and defeated the coup regime. You know, now they're prosecuting them. Of course, they're prosecuting them and human rights agencies in the U.S. are saying, well, there's violations of human rights. Violations of human rights. This is a coup regime, you know. They beat people on the street for being indigenous, for wearing, carrying the vifala, the flag of the indigenous and so on. Why did I write this book? I wrote this book because of a real life event that took place in November 2019 in front of your eyes, you know. Um, many of you would have been in high school or in college, just in college, you know, in front of your eyes. U.S. government played a nasty role here. Um, I decided that's the reason I want to write this book, so that you can read this history, a history that I have read and studied and understood and lived through, and also a history that's available in your libraries, but in enormous books filled with turgid histories and lots of citations and no hope, you know, no hope. And I thought, I want to write a book where every section is like a Facebook post. Because I'm fed up with saying that, with hearing people say young people don't read. I felt like I want to write a book which young people will want to read. It's not that they don't read or won't read. It's what will they want to read? That's what I wanted to write. In fact, that's the books I write now. You know, most of the books I write are like this. I want to write a book that you want to read. Chomsky and I have a book coming out in August called The Withdrawal, 
about the fragility of U.S. power after the withdrawals from Iraq and Afghanistan and so on. It's a book I want you to read. You know, the first question I asked Noam when we started doing the book is, where do you get the courage from? And Noam's answer was, I'm not courageous. I'm a privileged guy in the United States. He said, you want courage? Ask the peasants in southern Colombia. He was like, ask the Palestinians, you know. I see your flag behind you. Ask the Palestinians. And then he said, the real courageous people, the Vietnamese. He said, they fought the whole US war machine. They are courageous. And I thought, that's how we'll open the book. You know, who's really courageous? So our book, The Withdrawal, opens with that. Who's not a pilot who's sitting in Nevada, you know, on a joystick with an unmanned drone flying over Somalia just bombing the shit out of people, you know, that's not courage. That's not courage. That's a person who's going to face a lot of psychological trauma. That person is going to face a lot of trauma because they're killing people, you know, from far away. There's no honor in, honor in that. I don't believe there's honor in any killing, but there's much less honor in that, you know. Um, so, that's why I wrote that book. You know, you ask me, Anthony, say a few things about the book. What can I say? You know, I'm trying to, be I'm begging you. I'm saying to you, there's a history there. The CIA doesn't exist to hand out toffees to people. You know, now they've been doing these TikTok ads. Look, I'm black. Look, I'm Latina. Look, I'm gay. I'm in the CIA. That's a really dangerous propaganda campaign. The U.S. Apache helicopter squad saying we have now an all-gay helicopter squad. All-gay helicopter squad? Come on, guys. How is this progress? How is this progress? You know, what about having an all-gay public health unit in Minneapolis that goes door-to-door -door and tests people for COVID-19? You want an all-gay something to be proud of? Make it a public health unit. Doesn't have to be an Apache helicopter squad that's going to go and kill children in Pakistan. So there it is. I wrote the book for you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, you know, I was thinking as as you were talking about um, uh, the beginning and and Evo Morales uh, writing the opening for you. Um, a piece that stuck out to me when I opened the book uh, was the other piece of the opening was uh, the quote from Discourse on Colonialism. Um, and I mean, if nobody's read it, um, please do, because I mean, it's just as relevant today as it was when it was written. Um, but so the quote is about um, the barbarism of the United States. Um, can I ask like what your thoughts are in terms of like, um, is there an end to that? And and what I mean is like we've we hear talks now of like maybe we're moving to a multipolar world as opposed to a, a unipolar world. Um, do you see anything like that changing? I mean, times are very weird right now, obviously, um, over the past couple of weeks. You know, it's a good question, and I'm glad you raised that text because in the text. What M. S. Cesar, who was a great communist from Martinique, you know, from the island in the Caribbean, great poet, great philosopher. What M. S. Cesar does in the beginning of the text, he says, "Listen, fellas, the text is written in published in 1950 by Presence African Press, five years after World War II ends." He says, "Listen, you had a terrible event take place in Europe, the Holocaust, appalling." Six million Jews, gays, communists, gypsy, Roma, and so on, killed. Horrible, you know. But listen, he says, there's nothing unusual about this Holocaust. Six million people were killed in the Congo. Hundred, you know, tens of millions of people killed in the Middle Passage. Brutal brutalities in... India, in Malaya, you know, in, in here, there, everywhere. I mean, we don't know how many people actually were killed, native people, after the Colombian crossing, you know, when Columbus comes to the so-called New World. We don't know how many millions of people were killed. M. S. Cesar says, listen, the Holocaust 
that's the colonial experience coming back to Europe, he says. After all, look at Hitler. Hitler's talking about a Lebensraum, breathing room is what he calls it. Germany needs breathing room. So instead of colonizing Africa, it will colonize the land of the Slavs, says Hitler. And you know what's interesting? If you read Mein Kampf, which I think is interesting to at least know what's in there. You don't have to read it, please. But it's interesting as a historical exercise because here's what's interesting. Hitler says the Germans need breathing room, Lebensraum. From the Slavs, it will be taken. That's why it was so important to go and first link the Sudetenland, you know, unify the German speaking people and then go east to seize those lands and exterminate the people and take the soil. And he says, justification for that. What the English did to the native people of the Americas, he said, they also went there and made Lebensraum and exterminated the native people. You know, anytime I hear people in places like the United States and all that talking about, you know, oh, Hitler's project so ugly. Hitler failed. Hitler failed his project. The United States succeeded. In the same project, it went west and exterminated the people and created Lebensraum. Isn't that a terrifying thought? What MSSR is saying is, guys, you just did this in the colonies already. And what's so interesting is, like when you look at the war in Ukraine, right? You hear American TV presenters say, oh, we are so moved because this is happening in Europe. Children with blue eyes and blonde hair. You know, it's a, it's so touching, it's not Kabul, it's Kiev, you know, as if it's okay to bomb Kabul. I call this the international division of humanity. There are two kinds of humans. You know, people now recognize we're all human, right? But there's two kinds of humans. There's the European human whose humanity is definitely of a greater price than the other humans. And it's not from the 19th century that I'm talking or even the 20th century, you know, when there's explicit text. I'm talking about explicit text today from a CBS reporter. And by the way, he just comes on the next day and apologizes, everything's okay. I'm not saying he should, should be canceled or anything, okay? But at least they should remove him from Ukraine. Let him do another story. I mean, what credibility does he have now? You know, but anyway, I'm not picking on him. It's not about him. It's an attitude, you know? So when you ask, well, you know, was multipolarity isn't going to change that. You're, you're mostly, most of you are in Minneapolis. We know what happened in Minneapolis. The whole world knows. We don't need lessons in human rights. I mean, I'm sitting and talking to you from Santiago today. Okay, in, in the country of Chile. Tomorrow it will inaugurate a new president. This country, it had horrendous human rights violations. Thousands of people killed openly by the military during the coup. Three people in the United States are killed by the police every day. Three people. And they are disproportionately not white. They're on the other side of the international division of humanity. You know, one million communists were killed in Indonesia in 1965. One million in the matter of weeks. Why isn't that taught to people? The United States did a coup in Brazil. The coup regime lasted 21 years. I have interviewed many people in Brazil, thousands of militants killed. We don't even know their names, you know. We don't know their names. And it's the governments that did all this that now still continue to talk about human rights. Why is the Ukraine war more important than the war in Iraq or Syria or Yemen that's ongoing or Somalia? And I'm fed up with people saying, oh, you're doing whataboutry. You're not... I, I, I condemn the Russian invasion of Ukraine, okay? You want me to say it? I say it. I condemn it. The same people that are so hot and bothered about the Russian invasion of Ukraine supported the US invasion of Iraq. And that's the international division of humanity. They don't give a shit about Iraqi lives. Million people plus killed in Iraq in that war. 
million plus. It's an illegal war. Million plus. Not one person was found to have committed a war crime. Today, they're already hot and bothered talking about Putin's war crime. Condoleezza Rice was on American TV. I watched the clip nodding her head when the presenter said that Putin had attacked a country, invaded a country illegally, and therefore it was a war crime. And Condoleezza Rice nodding her head. She was a person in charge of invading Iraq, a great country where I visited many times. These are war criminals. Condoleezza Rice, George W. Bush, war criminals. They'll face nothing. So when you ask, you know, world, no, the depth of racism has to be confronted directly. The Chinese and the Russians, they may get more powerful, but that's going to do shit for this terrible cultural problem that the West has. And again, I'm not looking at evidence, Anthony, from the 20th century. I'm talking about now. Blue eyes, blonde hair, for God's sake. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so, so that kind of leads me to something that we in the anti-war committee really came across as we as we read and discussed the book. Um, because primarily the reason why we read it is because we're activists and we're organizers. Um, we're out in the streets and and we're we're organizing with different groups in in our community. Um, and the thing that stuck out for us was the manual for regime change um, in part two of the book. Um, because everybody really felt like this is a toolkit that every activist that wants to call themselves an uh, anti-imperialist or anti-war or whatever um, should understand at, at just like a fundamental level. Um, so kind of thinking about that, um, we were trying to find ways to, to really put that into context to what we see uh, every day right now. Um, so like since the book was released, we've seen new and old targeted media campaigns like against China, Cuba, Palestine, obviously Russia right now. Um, could you maybe touch on that a little bit in terms of uh, what strategies we've seen the U.S. trying to take since this book was released? Firstly, it's important to understand that for all the talk about multipolarity and all that stuff, Russians and Chinese don't understand how to manufacture consent with the media. They are hopeless at it. Um, partly, I have to say, the West owns the megaphone, okay? And those who own the megaphone can use it to sound loudest, okay? We know that, right? But these countries are hopeless at it. Now, I get it. There's the Great Wall of Mandarin. You know, the Chinese have a um, disadvantage, uh, which is to say they don't have huge troll armies to go out there in English, you know. Um, Russians also face some disabilities in this case. They, they don't have, um, you know, because we know that international news coverage is framed in English. It's just a fact, you know, CNN reports, New York Times, Washington Post, they report and people then basically follow along. Uh, at least the capitalist media in different parts of the world follows along. These countries are hopeless. L look at the case of Ukraine, okay? Why didn't the Russian authorities, um, because there were atrocities taking place in eastern Ukraine, you know, 14,000 people killed, that's a UN number, 50,000 people injured, there were atrocities happening. Why didn't they go to the UN and put a Security Council resolution, let the US veto it. You know, the US does this all the time. They put resolutions knowing the Russians will veto, knowing the Chinese will veto, and then they say, look at them, they keep vetoing. But the Russians don't put resolutions basically waiting for the US to veto and then doing a press conference saying, look, there are human rights atrocities, they're vetoing it. They don't even do that. When Zelensky, you know, made a statement. I, he gave a speech. He said, look, I'm Jewish. I'm also against the Nazis. At that point, why didn't Mr. Putin get on a plane, fly to Kiev and tell Zelensky, let's do a joint conference against Nazis? 
pushed Mr. Zelensky into a box to condemn the Nazis in his own parliament. You know, they don't do anything like that. They they don't think about consent. You know, the creation of consent. You see, if you get my meaning. So that's important. But the, the other side of it, look look at what passes for the media in the West. I mean, look at what passes for the media. They take State Department press releases and print them as stories. You know, this was there. I write about it. Actually paid people sent to Guatemala to cover and so on. New York Times, you know, was told who to send by the CIA. I have the details in the book. But forget that. Today, you know, um, I've met New York Times correspondents around the world when I've been reporting. Firstly, a lot of them just have an instinctual faith in the U.S. government. They just think the U.S. government is there to do good. You know, they have just instinctual faith. And they also carry all kinds of racist assumptions. Arab leaders are brutish. You know, um, Asians are inscrutable. You don't know what the Chinese are saying. I mean, for God's sake, that's like old-fashioned racism, you know. Listen to them. The Chinese, when they speak, are not lying to you. They're telling you things. If you can listen, you might learn something, you know. Um, take people seriously, man. Putin is talking to you. I, I find that what a lot of Mr. Putin said to be totally wrong. I found his speech attacking the Soviet policy of nationalities given a few days before the invasion. I, I thought it was totally wrong. He totally misread Soviet nationality policy for the interests of his own particular, you know, what he wanted to do. I'm not a shill for any of these people, but I like to listen to them. I want to understand what they're saying. You know, when two people are in a room together, you don't just try to impose your viewpoint on the other person. Even if you want to win, you should listen first, see where they come from. You know, it's also human decency. The German defense chief, just before, 10 days before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, German defense chief was in New Delhi. He gave a speech where he said something pretty anodyne, okay? German defense chief said, Mr. Putin should be respected. We should respect him. If we give him respect, he might calm down a little bit. Frankly, I found that a little objectionable as a statement, like as if the problem is Putin not being given respect. But that's not the story I'm telling you. For saying that, he was fired. Because how dare he say Putin deserves respect? He was literally fired um, a day after he made that comment in New Delhi. Okay, that's pretty amazing. So the manufacturing of consent happens all the time, you know, and it's quite ugly. Um, look, I saw, and then Rania Khalek and I talked about it on her show, an interview done on PBS with an open neo-Nazi mayor of a town in Ukraine. Well, if you Googled his name, you'd find a Jerusalem Post story. It's the first thing that comes up where the Israeli government was actually upset that this guy won the mayor's seat, an open Nazi. Behind him on the wall was a picture of Stefan Bandera. Now, Bandera was killed by the KGB in the 1950s in West Germany and so on. But before that, Bandera he had an interesting history. He was a right-wing Ukrainian nationalist who was used by the Nazis. Then they sent him off to a concentration camp. Then when the Soviets were advancing, they released him and sent him off to create a Ukrainian republic. And so he went along with the Nazis and was a fascist, open fascist. So this PBS news, nothing wrong with interviewing him, okay? It's a story of interest. Go and interview him by all means. It's PBS news interviewed an open Nazi. Again, if you Google his name, it's one of the first things that comes up. But here's the great scandal. They blurred the picture of Bandera. They blurred the picture of Bandera. They never mentioned that he's got a picture of a bloody Nazi behind him, and that he is a neo-Nazi. This is PBS, okay? This is not Fox News, or this is not 
CIA news service. This is supposed to be public broadcasting service. And I'm not telling you, I'm not saying that PBS should report what I believe, okay? I'm not even saying that. But they blurred his picture. That means they're lying to the audience, willfully lying to their audience, okay? And they get away with it. That's the biggest insanity. They get away with it. Uh, okay, so so on that, um, you know, uh, it, it's funny that you mentioned that because we in the anti-war committee actually watched that clip last night. Um, we we did our own kind of little teach-in. Um, but so uh, we in the committee, we we had thought a lot about. Um, there's another part in the book where um, where you reference uh, Kwame Nkrumah. Um, uh, and neocolonialism, uh, another great book that people should check out. Um, and you talk about how after World War II, uh, Nkrumah says, you know, it's it's not east-west, it's north-south. Um, and, and thinking about what you're talking about, uh, I, I think specifically us in the United States, um, we, we very often tend to forget the global south perspective um and you know thinking about how i mean you're in chile right now um you know what what's going on there right now in terms of like how how are global south nations you know like uh looking at this because obviously you know they don't have cnn in their ear the way that we do um blasting us on twitter um you know i'm curious what, what that looks like there I mean, like I said to you earlier, you know, a lot of the news coverage is refracted through um, Western news sources. And increasingly, there's a lot of pressure on Russian RT, for instance. RT has had to close down and so on. In many places, RT was providing an alternative storyline. Even for local reporters, when they put their stories together, they could listen to RT and get an alternative storyline. Access to RT is getting harder and harder. Social media is, you know, cutting RT off. Um, these are interesting countries, you know, these kind of semi-pro-American countries, pro-US countries. Um, it's not that different, I mean, in outlook, okay? Uh, there are in these countries there are stronger lefts. Today I went to a seminar where there was a lot of talk about the new order in the world and the role of Russia and China and so on. Great interest in all this. In uh, Argentina, for instance, a country really screwed by the IMF, the government of Alberto Fernandez cut a deal to join the Belt and Road Initiative, which is initiated by the Chinese government. Um, you know. China does three times as much trade with, uh, with, with Chile than the United States does. Three times as much. Um, so the perspective is slightly different. You know, today I drove past a warehouse called Chino Mall. The whole mall is filled with Chinese goods. Um, and this has an impact, you know. Um, you know, your first encounter now with the Chinese is Huawei and plastic goods and so on. The first encounter with the Yanks might be the IMF. And that creates its own perspective. But I won't say that that influences the mainstream news. Because the mainstream news is, gen it's so expensive to make news. They're generally the piper, who owns the piper calls the tune, you know, the piper sings not only along the CNN tune, but also the owners of these channels. Um, in Brazil, for instance, the biggest channel is Globo. That might as well be like Bill O'Reilly TV, you know? It's a rabid far-right television. But that doesn't mean that the perspectives inside are not more complicated. And that's what I just want to say, yeah. Um, so I kind of wanted to ask, um, you were talking about 
um, how you incorporated poetry into your book and how you wanted to make this a book that people wanted to read. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the reception of your book and whether or not you feel that it does reach a younger audience. Um, because it's a very small book and you like you could you could like you said you could talk about the things the CIA has done for an encyclopedia's worth of information but um i'm just curious if you feel like young people have responded to this book and also if you feel like young people are um distrusting of like the corporate channels you know or like the mainstream media do you feel like there's uh, a need for like sources other than the new york times and the washington post that sort of thing um and do you feel like this book is being received by that crew? I mean, it's hard to say, okay? Um, I get it. I understand things from two different ways. I, I know this book is selling a lot. And also it downloads a lot in the free sites. Uh, so I, I hear that. Um, okay, that's one good indicator. Um, but then there are people like yourselves, you know, who will say, well, we're reading it in a group. Let's have a conversation. I, I've done a lot of these kind of conversations. I enjoy them. Um, that's why you write a book, you know. Uh, and by the way, now that book tours and all that are impossible, I suppose these Zoom book clubs are the closest thing to a book tour, you know. And I would like this book tour to go on for a long time. Because this is not the kind of book where, you know, it's it's timely. This is bloody eternal. Um, until, you know, cooing stops. Uh, this is eternal. Okay, but you asked me a slightly different question as well. How are people, is, is the method of, or is the style working? So I teach a class uh, nowadays online, but I used to teach it all over India on socialist writing. And you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about this. How should a socialist write? The idea of socialist writing basically is you want to build confidence in your readers. Your readers mustn't feel intimidated by a book. They must feel confident enough in themselves as they read, both to understand, to develop a theory, and to act in the world. And that's why the mood of a book should not be, an author should not come off telling the reader, I know everything, you know nothing. How do you do that and yet convey information? And so I feel like you do that in a way by firstly not overwhelming the reader but also giving them epiphanies and that's where poetry comes in. You know, in the United States, liberty is a statue. That's a great poem, you know. And it says a lot and I want you to think about that, you know. A liberty is a statue because it doesn't exist for a lot of people. And it, the country is not seen like that, particularly in Latin America. You know, it's not seen as a great liberator. It was Bolivar who was the liberator, not the Bay of Pigs. It was Castro who was the liberator, right? Not the Bay of Piglets that they tried in Venezuela and so on, you know. So in that sense, um, I'm always learning because I want to be, I want to produce later a text on socialist writing. So I want to always hear from people, you know, what works, what doesn't work. Um, some people tell me they find the poetry irritating. Some people say they want more didactic stuff, you know, like bullet points and like don't meander. People write back and say, I want footnotes. I don't need that one. See, I hate footnotes. See, what is a footnote for? There's two reasons. One is it's for somebody to go and check your work, which is a legitimate double blind kind of scientific exercise that, you know, I shouldn't just make up quotes. Somebody should be able to check the quotes, right? What if I made up everything? Um, so I understand that. But footnotes also have an intimidating function, you know, this feel uh, that they're saying to the reader, look, read all this shit. You know, you haven't read anything. I've read all this. Um, so I, I decided, forget it. 
I'm not going to put footnotes. Um, and sometimes I say, if you want them, ask me. But I honestly don't know where to find them anymore. I used to make a file for this book, Rasta of the Third World. I made a file. I don't know where it is. Um, but to tell you just to say the answer is that it's an exercise. You should never, when you're writing, strive for perfection. Strive for communication. Strive to reach somebody, not to write the best book possible. You know, that's why I don't like books that get reviewed in the New York Times and the New Yorker and all of them. They all sound the same. They all sound like people who want to win the Pulitzer Prize. They write laden with adjectives, giant big books about small subjects. Michael Lewis is, he writes short sentences at least, but that, you know what I mean? These kind of books about like, why is this county in Alabama so racist? And so they'll go and spend time and then they'll write long sections about one family. Very useful. But that's not my scene, man. That's, that's a different kind of read, you know, for a different kind of reader. I want the book to be read by people like you where you carry it in your backpack when you go to a protest and if you're getting beaten by the cops, you rip it out and whack them on the head with it. I'll definitely make sure to bring it with me to the next protest. That'll be soon. Or give um, it to somebody. That's the other thing. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I, I'm happy to, to borrow out or give out my copy now that I've gotten a chance to read it. Um, did you have any final thoughts on the book or, uh, we kind of wanted to move into give people some time to ask you questions. Um, I know that that was sort of our last, uh, our last thing to do is maybe talk about some upcoming events and things like that. And then we would go into a Q and a section, but I wanted to make sure you got to, um, say your piece on, on the, on the book you just wrote. Go ahead. Let's move on. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, well, thank you. Um, we do want to have uh, time for people to ask questions. And the way that we are going to do that is through this program that we're going to use called AHA Slides. Um, so people should see on their screen, there should be an, a link to our section on AHA Slides where you can submit a question and then people can see and then um, upvote them. Um, while you are figuring that out, I will also just mention that we have a few upcoming events that I want to put on people's radar um, for local people in Minneapolis. I know this is a live event, so maybe not everyone um, is in Minneapolis. I hope people have tuned in. But if you are in town on March 19th, we're going to have a protest of the uh, 19th anniversary of the start of the war in Iraq. Um, Minnesota Peace Action Coalition is going to be putting that on. Uh, it's Saturday at 1 p.m. in front of the Walker Library in Uptown, which is 2800 Hennepin Avenue. Um, and it's going to be Say No to War. Um, and, you know, obviously we want to talk about no war with Russia, et cetera. But we also want to just uh, make sure that people remember that, you know, we did, the U.S. did murder over 1 million Iraqi people and um, never, no one ever was accountable, held accountable for that. So, March 19th, that's a Saturday. Um, the next upcoming event is going to be on the U of M campus. We have from Minneapolis to Palestine, Solidarity Against uh, State Terror. That event is on March 24th at 7 p.m. Um, and it's gonna be at the University of Minnesota in Smith Hall, room 231. Um, that is a joint event with Students for Justice in Palestine. Uh, we're also uh, there with Twin Cities uh, Coalition for, um, Twin Cities Coalition for Jamar Clark and also uh, Students for a Democratic Society. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting my acronyms. Um, so SJP, SDS, and TCC for J will be joining us to have a conversation about uh, police violence and state terror and the connections between. Um, and then I believe we had uh, one of our uh, joint, our, our co um sponsors of this event, um, Women Against Military Madness, sent us a question. And I'm just going to start off with that one. And then um, we'll see if we can get some questions in from the group. So let's see, Wham! Women Against Military Madness would like to say, 
Uh, thank you to the Antwerp Committee for organizing this important and amazing discussion. And thank you uh, to Vijay for talking with us today. Uh, Wham would like to ask if there are any US funded and supported organizations or NGOs operating in Russia, which are involved in funding and organizing anti-Russian activities or demonstrations like the ones that we have seen in some Russian cities um, that you know of. Well, firstly, um, I just want to say that there are sincere people on the streets in Russia. I mean, I've been in touch with some of them and so on. Um, they, like many of us, don't really want to see a war. A uh, member of the Communist Party in the Duma, a uh, representative in the Duma, elected representative, uh, made a very powerful statement right when the war began. He said, I voted for the shelling to stop in the Donbass, not for Kiev to be shelled. Um, I mean, there's a lot of sincere people there protesting. Okay, That's the first thing. Um, I, I'm not one of those who believes that everything is a kind of color revolution, you know. Um, there, there are real things that happen. Otherwise, you could start saying the Minneapolis protests, Black Lives Matter, color revolution. You know, uh, that's nonsense. Um, people sincerely are angry about police violence. Same people angry about the war. Having said that, there's also a massive U.S. government agency called the National Endowment for Democracy, which funds a lot of weird organizations outside U.S. shores for democracy promotion, press freedom, etc. And it pays a lot of wacky people to do strange and odd things, okay? For instance, National Endowment for Democracy funds something called a Crimea Community Radio in Ukraine. The Crimea Community Radio is not based in Crimea. It's based in, I think, in Washington, D.C. Okay, Voice of America, funded by the U.S. government, okay, ran a story recently attacking Rania Khalek, whose show I was on recently and have known her for a long time, attacking Rania Khalek of being an agent of Russia. Excuse me, firstly, she's not an agent of Russia. She works now for Breakthrough News, based in New York City. This is Voice of America, which is fully funded by the U.S. government. Weird, you know, so weird. Uh, they have no self-perception that they are actually state-funded, you know. Not she, they are state-funded. So, yeah, there are organizations funded by the National Endowment for Democracy and other kind of... But I still wouldn't say, oh, well, there's protests happening in Russia, it's all you know, egged on by some U.S. funding project. I think they are sincere people who are against war. And I, I respect many of them, you know, because I think war is horrible. I, I, I just think, like you, you're, you're called the anti-war committee. You're not just anti-U.S. war. I hope you're anti-all wars, you know. And in which case, there are people in Russia just like you, sincere, sensitive people who don't want a war, you know, who would like diplomacy and, and more conversation and so on. Um, there are people like you in every country of the world. And what they're trying to do, we're trying to make people like you the majority. That's what we're trying to do. I'd prefer to spend hours talking to you than five minutes talking to a fascist in the exhaust battalion. Um, could you talk a little bit about the, um, you mentioned before, like, I, I forget what you called it, but I, I would call it the, the American exceptionalism, exceptionalism mentality, where like when our troops do it, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're starting a war for humanitarian crisis reasons, but when their troops do it, they're just like these thugs and bad guys. Um, do you feel like the propaganda that you're seeing coming out of the United States, um, do you do you find it hard to talk to people? Like, is everyone just like giving you the oh, you must be like a Russian bot, or you just must be a Putin fan? Because in the anti-war committee, we definitely have had a clear line on every U.S. occupation and every U.S. aggression, and we understand what our you know government is capable of. And you know, with recently what's been going on, 
there's been this whole like, oh, well, you know, we're supposed to tell Russia what to do. And, you know, Russia should do this and Russia should do that. And you need to condemn Russia. Um, for us, it's been trying to like communicate to people that like, you know, as citizens of the United States, we live here and it's our responsibility to talk to our government and, and hold them accountable for their actions. Um, do you feel like that um, propaganda is uh, working as well in other parts of the world? I mean, I know you said that, you know, it's sort of the, the news is, is fashioned after Americans megaphone, but do you feel like other people are just as susceptible or is that really just like a, a United States phenomenon? Um, like the, you know, the depth of the propaganda. Look, I, um, I, I think it may have been on Rania's show or somewhere I mentioned that people in Burma had, that I know changed their Facebook profile to the Ukrainian flag. Burma. What about the Rohingyas? You're bloody worried about Ukraine. What about the Rohingyas and so on? You know, um, you know, in Chile, there's been an emergency in the Mapuche areas. What about the bloody Ukrainians? What about Mapuche? You know, right here, um, these are massive human rights violations. Uh, I like every single person in the United States who puts a Ukrainian flag on, yellow and gold and so on. I want to ask them two questions. In your city, when the next black man or woman is killed by the police. It's probably going to happen tomorrow. Will you change your Facebook profile to their picture? Will you do that? I doubt it. And secondly, do you know what flag of the Congo looks like? Millions of people killed since 1995. Ongoing war, the Great Lakes War, since 1995. Do you know the flag of the Congo? And I bet people don't, you know. I think this is a global world. It's, a, you know, the music machine that suddenly ramps up the enormous social media pressure. Talk about bots. Enormous pressure to stand with the Ukrainians. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't, you know, say stop the war and the Ukrainians and so on. I'm not saying that. I'm very much against this conflict. But for God's sake, you never ever express solidarity with the Yemenis, Palestinians, Sahrawis, Libyans, Iraqis, Afghans. Never. Suddenly you become this great anti-war person. God's sake, have some decency. You know. And you are worried. So many people are being killed in, in Iraq. The New York Times database shows you three Americans killed every day from police violence. You know, that's unbelievable. That's a thousand some people a year. That may not sound a lot to a lot of people, okay? For 10 years, that's 10,000 people killed by police. Sounds a lot to me. Sounds a lot to me. You know how many people should be killed by the police? Zero. Police should not be in the business of killing people. Now, you'll say, well, the people have guns and they're dangerous and so on. But well, why are you harming the population? All of that, all of that. Now the United States is sending lethal weapons to Ukraine. Hillary Clinton emerges from a bunker in New York State to start talking about how they're going to convert Ukraine into Afghanistan. Afghanistan was the petri dish for right-wing nuts, crazy jihadis. Now Ukraine is going to be the petri dish for right-wing nuts, Nazis. And there'll be blowback. These Nazis are all going to go and learn how to fight in Ukraine. Then they'll return, you know, to Michigan. That, what was that? Remember the Michigan militia? These nuts will get battle hardened and then they'll come back home. What will they do? Don't risk it. You already had that problem with Afghanistan. Why double down and do it again? You know? Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I agree. Um, that actually is a great lead into one of the questions from our um, group, which is with so many Americans gripped by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, even those who have not been paying attention to American imperialist actions uh, are now paying attention. How should we, as the anti-war movement, um, where should our focus be? Like, how should we try to communicate with these people whose political awareness um, probably doesn't go back further than, say, 2016? I really, I don't want to give you any advice um, because I, you know better than I do. You understand your peers better. You understand your culture better than I do. I mean, I read a book, okay, about the history of coups and violence and information warfare and hybrid warfare and all that. You read it, you figured some things out, now go and use it. But I really can't tell you what to do, you know. I don't understand. My my elder daughter, for instance, is a TikToker. Once in a while, I, I watch her TikTok. You know, she can get like a million likes for a TikTok. I, I have no idea what's happening there. I don't presume to understand what you can do. But I know that in the United States in particular, there is iron that's rotting, that's corroding inside the soul. You know, mm-hmm. don't let the culture, don't let that iron corrode inside the soul. You have to do something. Now, what you do is up to you. I'm telling you, don't don't sit back and watch it corrode. You know, it's corroding. Super ugly. You know, the very fact that this government can raise money to go and get sell legal arms to Ukraine, right? But can't pass an investment bill to improve infrastructure in the U.S., fix the bridges, produce high-speed internet for people, produce high-speed rail in Minneapolis. You know, you should be able to get on a train in Minneapolis and go to New York City inside a day. You know, high-speed rail like they have in China. I think if you get in a train in Minneapolis, you have to change in Chicago. And then it's more than overnight to New York City. So it's probably like a day and a half, maybe more. It should be under a day. What is it from Minneapolis to New York City? 1,200 miles? I don't know. Can't be more than that. It's about a third of the way in in the US, but then up, right? US is about 3,000 miles across. So let's say 1,000 miles to Chicago from New York, 200 odd miles north. I don't know, roughly. Okay. You should be able to be in New York City in less than a day in a high speed room. But it's bloody forever, man. You have to hang around in Chicago air, train station and so on. You get into a train in China, you can't believe it. You can't believe it. The train from Shanghai to Beijing zips. Super fast train. Now, Republicans say, well, the reason they have good trains is they're authoritarian. Because, you know, they'll, they tell people who are taking your land to build a straight track. You can't really have a high-speed rail on a windy track, you know. You have to just use eminent domain and get land. But let me tell you something. When a power company or oil company wants to build a pipeline through Native American territory, they don't seem to care about private property. They just bring that damn pipeline and put it right through and say eminent domain. Go and read Nick Estes' book on Standing Rock. You'll see how much the Republicans and some cared about private property when it comes to Native American people. Okay, so I would prefer high-speed rail, frankly, than, you know, some petty nonsense about like you can't encroach on my field. You know, it's a social issue. You know, don't hold up society. I mean, I don't know. Maybe people disagree, but the point I'm making is not that. Okay. Point is, I don't know how to reach people like the way you need to, to build your organizations. You understand your culture. You understand where people are. You understand that you can tell them the old age thing. For years, we've been making this argument to people. 
look how crappy our infrastructure is. Look how fabulous the equipment is that the military gets. Do we need a Minuteman 3, which is going to cost $100 billion? Do, do, does the world really need a new Minuteman rocket? Is it necessary to deploy it, to threaten other countries? Why not go back to the intermediate forces treaty with Russia that Trump walked out of in 2018? Return to that treaty, stop the Minuteman 3, save $100 billion, end child hunger in the United States. Talk to people. Build your movements. Build the strength of your movements, right? Absolutely. I totally agree with that. And um, I definitely agree that the United States has its priorities all out of whack when it comes to how we spend our money. Um, you did talk a little bit about culture. There was a question in the in the chat um, that you mentioned the inspiration of the title being um, from The Clash. And as a historian, are, as a historian, are you often asked about your favorite writers and authors? Um, and if so, you know, did you want to share some? Also, what are some of your favorite albums? Fine, that's great. First authors, um, I had the enormous privilege and luck to spend time with Eduardo Galeano in Montevideo in Uruguay some years ago before he died. Um, he is definitely one of my favorite authors. I have two favorite authors. Sadly, they are both men. Um, one is Ryzad Kapuczynski, who was a Polish journalist, um, wrote brilliantly. Um, well, maybe I have three favorite authors, and I'm afraid all three of them are men. The other is James Baldwin. Love his writing, luminous writing. Um, Baldwin, Kapuczynski, Gagliano, I like them a lot, um, a lot. Um, yesterday, my teacher and great friend died, Ejaz Ahmed. I learned a lot from him as well. He died at the age of 81 yesterday. It was a big blow for me um, and for many people who read his writing. Music, um, I adore The Clash. Truly adore The Clash. Um, I grew up, I was born in 1967. So I came of age in the 1980s. And I really liked, got really into punk rock music in a big way. And eventually when I came to California, I used to have the all night um, show on KSPC, reaching almost all of Southern California. And I used to play, you know, the Dead Kennedys, the Dicks, a lot of American punk rock. And I used to spend um, at least one weekend day a month at Roxy in, um, in LA, Los Angeles. And because I had a popular radio show, I used to get to meet all these people. So I had an excellent time with Henry Rollins of Black Flag, it's a terrific band at the time. I, I don't think I can listen to much Black Flag now. Um, with Jello Biafra, who was an interesting guy, no doubt. Strange political idea, but interesting. Um, punk rock something, you know, Nina Hagen. I don't know if you know the German singer Nina Hagen. She was a big star in the LA scene. Um, and then I, I got very much interested in post-punk, like The Clash. And I like that music a lot. The, you know, guitar sound of The Clash. Um, I really like that, that music, very rhythmic and, and super. I never liked The Beatles and that kind of Western music. But, you know, later, obviously, when I had young children, I came to appreciate some of it. Um, I found it too syrupy. Uh, I needed something a little more toxic, maybe. Uh, and I like that sort of music. Um, I, I'm not really keen on any kind of classical music, which is why I didn't really go for Indian music. Um, a lot of it, even Indian film music is very close to kind of classical rhythms and so on. I like things that are a little harder. And there was nothing like the kind of punk rock music coming from the West, you know? Um, yeah, I sympathized with a lot of my friends in the Eastern Bloc. 
who you know they're okay with socialism and i mean you know but they like western music and you know some soviet punk bands were pretty good um but they didn't have much to i guess they didn't have as much to despair over um because you know a lot of the basic needs were taken care of housing education healthcare you know people think okay life in the soviet union was pretty dull could be true um but listen dull means you didn't have to deal with homelessness and and hunger and you know your basic needs were taken care of so yeah it was dull you know maybe when you walk down the streets of you know leningrad or whatever you you didn't see encampments of homeless people and misery of that kind you know that provoked the kind of punk rock music of the pistols you know uh in riotous music against inequality you didn't have that level inequality in the ussr you know i have to say that because i never saw it you know and it's not like i went there in the 80s and had some government tour no no the opposite roamed around everywhere but didn't see like encampments of homeless people first time i came to la i saw encampments of homeless people i thought what is this bloody country so rich and there are people sleeping on the street tents you know ronald reagan had made a statement at the time that americans need to camp out can you imagine the governor of california americans like to camp out it's bloody inhumane you go to to santa monica stunning such a rich part of los angeles so many homeless encampments stunning it's it's a real blight you know on a civilization there should never be any homeless never you know but then again maybe homelessness makes for good music god knows um maybe maybe i don't know about that um you did you did make me think of there's a particular uh book a collection of poetry called poetry like bread um i think it was in, it was written in the 80s and it's uh it's a collection of north and southern american poets and there's this there's a quote on the back that's talking about how poetry like bread is for everyone and that it is the job of revolutionary poets um to build hope and i was thinking about something that you said earlier about how you know we don't have to we don't have to convince people um that there is a problem the problems are in their own lives right they're experiencing the problems in the, their daily lives in the ways that they have to struggle and so i was wondering if you wanted to talk about um the role of artists maybe as a as the builders of revolutionary hope um one of the questions here from the the chat is how do we maintain a revolutionary optimism when we are about when when we are up against the impossible beast that is imperialism and um i guess i just would add to that like what do you think is the role of authors artists to not necessarily um tell people that there's a problem but like to um to instill in them a, the idea that there's something we can do about that problem yeah just you know one is a general human thing you know um i mean for humans in general like there will always be a group of people who will find injustice intolerable there'll always be there's always been it's a transhistorical phenomena you know from the buddha onwards um people just some people are there who just cannot live with you know inequality and and suffering and so on find it intolerable but there are others who shield themselves you know i'm not saying every human mind what i'm saying but there'll always be enough people and i think part of us struggle is to grow the camp of the sensitive part of our struggle is to grow the camp of the sensitive it's wrong to turn to somebody who says i don't care and say how can you not care must care and so on that's wrong you can't hound people or badger them into sensitivity to show them that they are actually they have capacity for sensitivity you know have that capacity you have to teach them um and so on that's the first thing years ago i i wrote a, a 
article about a communist street theater group in India. And I knew them very well. And one of the members of the group is my best friend. And we had spent a lot of time talking about these things. And when I wrote the article about the group, it occurred to me that, you know, doing street theater doesn't change the world. Um, doing street theater lifts us to imagine different possibilities and so on. Same with a book. Books don't change the world. Books give you a sense of something, you know, something different maybe for different kinds of books. Lifts you up in a way, gives you confidence, gives you hope, gives you a sense that you might be able to make a difference and so on. What changes the world is mass struggle. And so, you know, artists, artists give people confidence in a small way to get involved in mass struggles. But also artists can open a window to what the future might look like. And, and I don't just mean like science fiction, you know. Although you know, there are some terrific science fiction writers who are socialists. Octavio Butler, for instance, you know, is a socialist science fiction writer. She creates worlds beyond worlds. If you read, yeah, exactly. Super book, by the way, yeah. If you read Octavio Butler, you get a sense of the future. You know? That's possible, right? But also, um, there's something that a writer can do or an artist can do, a musician can do. There's a line in The Clash. I've forgotten which song. But the line goes like this. I've been looking for that one jazz sound that will knock down the walls of Jericho. You know, I've been looking for that one jazz sound which will knock down the walls of Jericho. And the thing is, the answer to that search is the sound is not going to knock down the wall. It's when the millions of people rush the wall, put their shoulders to the wall, that the wall will collapse. But that one jazz sound, that one horn might inspire people to run to the wall. You know, the okay, you can have some sort of newfangled sound weapon that you fire this jazz sound and it breaks walls. Okay, maybe. But that's not what Strummer is singing in that song, you know. I'm looking for that one jazz sound to knock down the walls of Jericho. The jazz sound will lift you up so you go and knock the damn wall down. So that's how I understand art. And I don't think artists should believe that they change the world. But artists can help shape the consciousness and inspire mass struggles. Mass struggles is the only damn thing that changes the world for the better. That's a good lead into my next question, which is, um, what do you think is missing from the U.S. left? And it seems like uh, the U.S. is reaching the end of a unipopularity. And I am worried, this is anonymous speaking, I'm worried that if we don't do something don't have a real socialist movement soon, the people, the working people of the world are fucked. Um, what do you think is missing from the left in the US and um, yeah, the world over, I guess? I mean, I already answered this question when I told you, go and find out. Um, as you struggle, you learn, you know. Um, Marx writes in the um, thesis on Feuerbach, the 11th thesis, he says, philosophers have understood the world, a point, however, now is change it, right? But listen, don't misunderstand what the old man is saying. Here's what I think he's saying. What he's saying is, those who are trying to change the world better understand it than those who are not trying to change the world, you know? So as you struggle to build your movements, you learn things that those who are not struggling will never learn you will learn a lot of things. And then you will be able to teach us how to build the movement next. You know, that, that's why I, build, I believe that movement knowledge is a fundamental thing to share. At Tricontinental, the institute that I direct, one of our charges is to essentially amplify the theories of movements, not to amplify the theories of theorists alone. 
You see, we've got to get down to understand what have been the lessons learned by movements. What are their theories? What do we learn from each other and so on? Okay, so yes, yes, there's a problem. The left is weak and so on. But I'm not going to give you 10 points to revive the left. I'm going to tell you that you will learn how to revive the left when you struggle. You can't learn this shit when you write your BA paper. You can't write a BA paper on the weakness of the left. The actual university for this is the struggle. And as you struggle, not alone, but in an organization, the organization will build wisdom. As a collective, you will build wisdom. And as you get bigger and bigger, your wisdom will increase. Okay, I'm going to leave you in like five minutes, okay? Well, then I will just say thank you now for joining us for this conversation. Um, we did want to make sure that if there was anything that you were had coming up that you would like people to know about, if there was anything you plugged, you mentioned that you were going to have a book coming out with Noam Chomsky in August. Um, was there anything more you wanted to say about that or just uh, sort of a wrapping up? I have three books coming out this year that I want to tell you about. Okay. One is the book in August with Chomsky. Um, which I'm very happy with. Um, Noam is 95 years old. And we collaborated basically uh, in an equitable way on this book. It's not like I did the heavy lifting. He was incredible. He's an incredible inspirational person. And I have a friendship of 30 some years with him, which started first in letters that I hand wrote to him. And he type wrote his responses back to me, an unknown person writing to him from India. I have many of those letters with me. And it's a great friendship. You know, I'm a communist. He is an anarchist. Um, but we are both humans. We both believe in the left. We don't participate in the kind of rankless nonsense that takes place sometimes on social media. You know, tanky, you're a tanky, you're a this, you're a that. I mean, it's just a waste of time. And it's ridiculous. You know, we're trying to build a movement here. Uh, we're not trying to score points and appear to be the most smart people or the best left or whatever. No left is built out of that kind of idiocy. You know, frankly, I told you I won't give you any less. The one thing I can say is oh, this bullshit pseudo debate online about, you know, you're a tanky, you support Putin. I mean, grow up, you know, let's have a serious discussion. Um, so that I can tell you is that no, I, we come from different places. He's definitely an anarchist. I am definitely a Marxist, you know, but we have a great love and affection for each other. Um, we built a, a, a view of the world. I've learned an enormous amount from him. Um, and, you know, much more than I learned from many Marxists um, because he has a very humane understanding of international relations. And I like that. It's not all about geopolitics and, you know, he, he thinks of people first. I, I like that. It's an instructive thing for Marxists to, to keep reminding ourselves that we are motivated by great love for people. Um, as Che Guevara said, you know, great love for people is what motivates us. The second book is called um, Struggle Makes Us Human. And it's uh, based on a conversation I had with Frank Barat, uh, who's based in Brussels. That will come out from uh, from Haymarket Press. Um, uh, and that's a, basically a conversation about the COVID world and the post-COVID possibilities. And again, I'm happy with it, although it's mainly a long interview with me, so I don't know what nonsense I talk about, but that's that. And the third is, after many, many, many years, in March this year, this month, hopefully, or early April, a book I've worked on again for many, many, many years, and I think of as the most important thing I've done in a long time, is going to come out, and that's uh, Selections from Ho Chi Minh. Um, I'm super proud of this book because it's the first real new collection of Ho Chi Minh's writing in years. It includes, and this is what makes it so special, it includes the first translations from Viet of his lectures that he gave in China in the 1920s. 
And in the selections, we've included his lectures on revolutions, where he talks about the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the Russian Revolution, and so on. Super interesting. Um, and you can see in what I've collected here, and many of the pieces new from Viet, what I've collected is Ho Chi Minh talking theoretically about revolution. One of the things that really pisses me off is the view that all theory is made in the West and that Che Guevara, Ho Chi Minh, Mao, they're all just practitioners. If any theory is produced by them, it's about how to do guerrilla war. Mao on guerrilla struggle, General Giap on guerrilla struggle, Che Guevara on guerrilla struggle and so on. Even Walden Bello, who's from the Philippines, who introduced the Ho Chi Minh it's not really a new collection. It was just republished things um, from a collection done in 1967. Uh, even Walden Bello writes that Ho Chi Minh is not a theorist. And I read that and thought, wow, you don't respect the deep thinking that the Vietnamese put into their work. Ho Chi Minh was the accumulator of the thinking of his party, the Communist Party of Vietnam. No. When I say selections from Ho Chi Minh, Ho Chi Minh as the embodiment of the Communist Party of Vietnam's thinking. It's not really just the individual, you know, it's, it's a collective process. But boy, it was fun. And that's coming out from Leftward Books, either in the end of this month or early next month. It's a beautiful book. And it's dedicated to my teacher and friend, Ajay Zahmat. So that'll come out from Leftward. Uh, awesome. Uh, Vijay, thank you so much. Uh, before we go, I would be remiss if I did not mention to you that I received a text uh, during this chat from a friend out in California who is extremely excited about your shout out for Nina Hagen. So uh, so there's that high note to leave us on. Um, yeah, uh, so just really wanted to say thank you to everybody for joining us uh, in the anti-war committee tonight. Uh, and Especially thank you, Vijay, uh, for taking time out of your very busy life uh, to sit here and chat with us for the last hour and a half. So we, re we really, really appreciate it. Um, yeah. Well, thanks, Misty. Thanks, Anthony. And thanks, Wyatt, for being in some sort of mysterious um, office where Wyatt has been handling the tech. That's great. Thanks, guys. Take care of yourselves. Bye. <laughs>